Good morning students and a very warm hello to all of you on this chilly morning in Gandhinagar. Students, if you had watched our program on Samuel Johnson and the Odes of Keats, then you will already be well acquainted with our expert speaker today. If you are joining us for the first time, then allow me to introduce Madam to you. She is Dr. Indira Nityanandam, no. serving presently as, present, as Principal Srimati S. R. Mehta Arts College, Ahmedabad. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Namita. Today's lecture will be on prosody, a topic that I would say most students as well as teachers sometimes find it find difficult. But I, I hope at the end you will find that we have been able to make prosody very easy for all of you. Ma'am, if you could just tell us something about prosody. Thank you, Namita. I think uh, the word prosody frightens us because when you read poetry, what are you reading poetry for? What is important in poetry? Are you looking at the meaning? These questions come to mind. But prosody is something about the flow, something about the music, something about the rhythm, something about the meter. Look at the slide, my dear students. You will notice that there is flow. Prosody is about the flow in poetry. Everywhere there is rhythm all around us, natural as well as man-made. Tides ebb and flow. The moon waxes and wanes. Spring, summer, autumn, winter follow in a regular order. Night succeeds day and day night. Within our bodies, heart and lungs work rhythmically. We are born, grow up, mature, decay and die. We dance and sing, creating our own rhythms in movement and sound. Our everyday speech is rhythmical. And that is why we are going to talk about prosody. My dear students, just listen to this little verse that I am going to read to you. Maybe some of it doesn't make any sense. But as Namita said at the end of the hour, and I am sure it's going to make a lot of sense to you. Just listen carefully to this. Iambic feet are firm and flat and come down heavily like that. Trockies dancing very lightly, sparkle, froth and bubble brightly. Dactylic daintiness lilting so prettily moves about fluttering rather than wittily. While for speed and for haste such a rhythm is the best as we find in the race of the quick anapist. I'm sure you notice some words that probably are new to you. Probably that you already heard of them in the class on prosody. I am big, trocky, dactyl, anapist. Let's see. We're going to talk about that. But Namita, do you think every poetry, every poem is read like that? Or do you think poems are read in a different way? Definitely in a different way, ma'am. In fact, why don't we try out this poem? Yeah, let's hear that, uh, Namita. Break, break, break on thy cold grey stones, O sea. And I would that my tongue could utter the thoughts that arise in me. Oh, well for the fisherman's boy that he shouts with his sister at play. Oh, well for the sailor lad that he sings in his boat on the bay. And the stately ships go on to their haven under the hill. But oh, for the touch of a vanished hand and the sound of a voice that is still. Break, break, break. At the foot of thy crags, O sea, but the tender grace of a day that is dead will never come back to me. That was beautiful, Namita. Uh, I'm sure, my dear students, you noticed that there is a lilt, that there is a tune, that there is a music. Do you always notice this when you read a poem, when you hear a poem being read? Remember, poetry should always be read aloud. Silent reading does not help you get the music of the poem. When you look at a poem, my dear students, can I have the next slide, please? What is it that you're looking for in a poem? I'm sure the matter and the manner, Namita, are Definitely. equally important. Let us think of a poem which is very, very well known to most of our students. I'm thinking of Milton's sonnet, On His Blindness. Let us begin by looking at what the subject matter is. What do you think the poem is about, my dear students? I'm sure a hundred answers come to your mind. Namita, 
What do you think is the main uh, theme or the subject? I would say it is religious in nature, uh, devotion to God. Uh, and uh, something and, if uh, yeah and, like, and and Namita you remember this question of what am I going to do mm -hmm. if I have a talent right. which I cannot use? use and that is why he uses a form which was very popular in his time mm -hmm. in the Elizabethan ages as well as the Puritan mm -hmm. he uses a form which we call the sonnet uh -huh. remember my dear students you all know about the sonnet that must have rung a bell absolutely I'm sure uh, what else contributes to the greatness of a poem? I think figures of speech are right. very, very important. very important. Namita, can you quickly tell our students what figures of speech? If, uh, if they remember similes, metaphors, uh, if we uh, talk about on his blindness in particular, mm -hmm. then uh, uh, Milton uses plenty of similes, metaphors, and uh, ma'am, uh, yeah. the pun that he uses? Very important. Remember, right. he talks about the talent. And to most of us, talent is kaushalya, mm -hmm. talent is ability, mm -hmm. talent is capability. But Milton uses it in another sense, in a biblical sense. The biblical English used the word talent to mean a gold coin, you know, a mohra. Uh, he uses it in that sense because he says to hide it would be death to me. And at the end of the poem, we ask ourselves, what is the appeal that the poem makes to you? Because when you read a poem, that's very important. It's important that it should have a message because Absolutely. that reaches our hearts. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Ma'am, when I, whenever I think of On His Blindness, mm -hmm. I'm reminded of Abu Ben Adhem to a large extent. Ah, yes. May his tribe increase. Yes, what makes you see the connection, Anita? I think both, uh, both the poems have religion as an important theme. Absolutely. And uh, devotion to God because mm -hmm. Abu Ben Adhem at the end also says that uh, he tells the angel mm -hmm. that uh, then tell God that I love his creation creatures mm. and then the angel returns and he, uh, the angel says that uh, your name tops the list of those that God loves uh, you remember that uh, service to humanity is service to God yes. you know, it's something like yes. that because if Definitely. you love God's creatures mm -hmm. uh, obviously you love God yes. in the same way if you serve humanity you're serving God, God. Uh, all poems need not have a model but right. some of these poems have a fantastic model fantastic. for our students for all readers, it would be wrong to say students because all of us, at whatever age we may read poetry, uh, it appeals to us oh, at different course. ages probably for different reasons. When we are talking of prosody, my dear students, what we have to remember is something about the rhythm. Rhythm comes from the Greek word flow. There is a flow, as I told you at the beginning of the lecture, in everything around us. So rhythm comes from the word do not confuse rhythm with rhyme. Rhyme is what you generally see at the end of a line. And therefore, if I say king, mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. you're going to give me words like sing, ring, thing, wing. Ring, you know, you can ring, go on and on. Right. Uh, cat and then you have. Fat. Th right? That is rhyme. But we are talking about rhythm. You know, rhythm is something which is so much a part of music. Mm -hmm. Rhythm is something which gives a musical quality to poetry. Mm -hmm. And remember, when we talk of lyric, for example, at a literary form, the rhythm is very important. The English language has a rhythm, has a rhythmic quality about it, mm -hmm. uh, which probably is not true of all our languages, or maybe it's not true of all languages of the world. Definitely. Uh, Ma'am, in fact, English is said to have a stress, uh, said to be a stress-timed language, mm -hmm. whereas French, for example, is a syllable-timed um, language. Mm -hmm. That is uh, perhaps the difference between uh, the two. Yes. And uh, students might remember that in their uh, general English, maybe, mm -hmm. uh, they must have done something about stressed and unstressed. unstressed. We've talked about very simple words like about. Hmm. where you have some word is stressed and some word is unstressed. unstressed. Do you remember, students, something about monosyllable words? Mm -hmm. uh, Namita, would there be some examples that come to your Definitely, mind immediately? Uh, very simple words, in fact. Eat, uh, drink, sign, well, tweet. In fact, when we were in school, we mm -hmm. used to play a game. Usually you have one s monosyllabic words that are very short. Mm -hmm. And the longest that we could think of mm -hmm. uh, was seven letter words. Mm -hmm. School, uh, mm -hmm. squeeze, 
splurge mm -hmm. these are monosyllabic though they have seven letters i and think there's an interesting word which is not very common you know the site Yes, S C Y T H E. Yes, yes. Right. That's also a long word. S C Y T H E, but only six. Uh -huh. So you the win if you have got a seven syllable seven. word. Yeah, <laughs> sight. Right. I was thinking of psyche, but then psyche becomes two syllables. Two syllables. Right. Psyche. Right. So I can't have right. psyche. Right. Yeah. Uh, so we have this um, common feature of the English language, which sometimes makes it different for us Indians to learn the language, because uh, stress is very important. When you change the stress, the meaning could change. And I once met a British lady, you know, Namita, who told mm -hmm. me that when the rickshaw person said, the driver said, do you want to go to the hotel? Mm -hmm. She didn't understand. She says, thrice he asked me and thrice I didn't understand. And then I told myself, oh, hotel, hotel. <laughs> no, we don't say hotel, Namita. We all right. say hotel. Um, but syllable stress is very important. Very important. How would you, how would you distinguish uh, stress in syllables, uh, Namita? With some examples maybe for our students? Ma'am, for example, it is a common mistake in India to say develop because we do not know that the stress comes on the second mm -hmm. syllable. Mm -hmm. It should be students develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, similarly, like if you look at photograph mm -hmm. and it changes to photography mm -hmm. right. because this uh, syllable changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we gave you, uh, our ma'am gave you monosyllabic words. Uh, should we tell them about? Yeah, do tell them something about, you know, the stress on the first syllable, okay. stress on the second syllable. Uh, so that it's clear, so that when we go to scansion, you know, when Definitely. we talk about prosody, they'll okay. know really what we are talking so, about. So uh, if we take up two syllable words, the, where the stress is on the first syllable, mm -hmm. for example, giant, picture, heating, and two syllable words where the stress is on the second syllable. Today, ahead. Notice we don't say today, we say today. We don't say ahead, we say ahead. Allow. Then similarly, you can have three syllabic words. Energy, operate, organize. And going on to more, for example, four syllable words. Secondary. And you also have words where the stress is on the penultimate, that is, the second from the end. Graphic, geographic. Notice most students say geography, that is the wrong pronunciation. Mm -hmm. It's geography or geographic, Ge geologic, television, revelation. I think. Maybe no, I think it gets very clear. But right. students, remember, uh, we are stressing it so that it becomes clear to you. Right. You say it normally, even then you will get the, you will realize that you are stressing the right syllable. Right syllable. In most of our words. There could be one or two words where we make a mistake. But otherwise, most of the time we are saying it the right way. Hmm. And we shouldn't make it so artificial. Hmm. When we explain it to you, we make it clear. But right. when you say it, please say it continuously about, allow. Right? You don't have to say allow. Right. But you say allow, about, ahead, away. Very true. And you would notice that the stress is on the second syllable in all the words that I just mentioned. Could we have the slide please again? <coughs> Namita, we talked about word rhythm. Mm -hmm. Is there something about sentence rhythm also? Could you say something about what happens when we use sentences? Yes, ma'am. Like, for example, if I ask a question, where are you going? <coughs> yeah, that. Where are you going? Where are you going? going? Notice, students, and let's have Namita answering the question also. I am going to the cinema. Where are you going? Notice, where are you going? It's always rising. And where is Namita going? I'm going to, to the, the cinema. cinema. Right? I'm going to the cinema. Now, this rise and fall. Right, we call this sentence rhythm. rhythm. In the same way, when we look at words, when we look at stress and unstress, there are certain rules which guide us. A quick look at how figures at parts of speech take on either the stress or the unstress. unstress. Can we have the slide again, please? There are certain rules in the English language. Certain parts of speech are always stressed. Mm -hmm. For example, and remember students, I'm talking about single syllable words. Let's look at nouns, for example, Namita. Book. Na yeah. Uh, rule. They're all stressed. 
right? Right. They are always stressed when they are, we are talking about single syllables. Mm -hmm. In the same way, adjectives, when they are single syllables, like good, mm -hmm. like bad, mm -hmm. like clean. Sure. Right? Now what happens? All these are stressed. Mm -hmm. Verbs are stressed. Verbs are stressed. Dance, drink, play, walk, mm -hmm. eat, mm -hmm. sit, mm -hmm. speak, mm -hmm. they are all stressed. So are adverbs. Quick. Right? So are adverbs. In the same manner, there are certain rules about unstressed. Mm -hmm. I could put it very simply, my dear students, that the important words are stressed and the not so important or words which are performing only a grammatical function. function. For example, articles. Mm -hmm. Right? Articles don't have any meaning. Mm -hmm. You know? Mm -hmm. Pronouns. We know that they replace the noun. So you must have a noun in order to have a pronoun. So pronoun is performing a grammatical function. Mm -hmm. Now these words are most of the time unstressed. Mm -hmm. Again we are talking about monosyllabic words. So if you have auxiliaries like can, may, will, shall, would. If you have pronouns like mm -hmm. I, me, you, mm -hmm. they, them. them. If you have conjunctions like and, if. If you have prepositions like in, on etc. Mm -hmm. Right? They are all unstressed. unstressed. For example, you and me, mm. we, we uh, do not stress the and. We Absolutely. say very, very quickly. Absolutely. You know, when you write, you might write a cup a of tea. Right. But when you say it, Namita, you a say it as tea. a cup of tea. Right? A cup of tea. That's what we do. Very true. Why have we said all this to you in such great detail? Namita, I just want to restate that point, mm -hmm. emphasis the point that we are now going to move on to what we call meter. Mm -hmm. What is meter? You've probably heard of millimeter and kilometer and all that. Mm -hmm. But what is meter? Meter is a measure. How many millimeters make a centimeter? How many centimeters make a meter? A kilometer? You know, you could go on and on. In poetry too, we have a meter. It's a measure. It's a measure of poetry. It's a measure of rhythm. We've already talked about rhythm. It's a measure of rhythm into regular and recurring patterns. Recurring patterns. Students, just look at that word. It is patterns. P-A-T-T-E-R-N-S. Regular and recurring. That means the same beat. You know, it gives poetry what in uh, music we would call tal. You know, tal has to be equidistant. Tal has to come at the same, at the same pace, mm -hmm. at the same speed. Now, meter is something like that, a measure. I have been talking about, we've been talking about, Namita and me, we've been talking about stressed and unstressed. For reasons of poetry, when we talk about prosody, when we talk about scansion, we change the words and the unstressed are called short, short. and the stressed are called long. long. Okay. okay? Just remember students, stress and unstress are now replaced by long and short. short. In order to understand what we mean by meter, how we measure, we already have looked at stressed and unstressed. That means we have looked at long and short. Notice, my dear students, that there are two symbols. Can you see something like a, 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 a lying down C maybe? Slightly lying down C and something like a hyphen. Uh, for those of us who know Hindi or Gujarati, and I'm sure all of us know that, you know, we talk of the Chandra Bindu. You know, there is a, there's something uh, below the dot for a Chandra Bindu, my dear students. That is the kind of symbol, symbol. that we use. And the other symbol is a simple hyphen. hyphen. Those of you who are comfortable with the computer, you would need to go into the symbols, right? You won't get it on there. You won't get it on your keyboard. You won't get it immediately. Mm -hmm. You'll have to search for it. And if you search for it, and then when you get it, I'm sure it'll be great fun because you can use it on the poems that you are reading. So what are we now doing? We are now moving on into technical language. Mm -hmm. You know, in order to be able to do something well, in order to be able to appreciate something. Remember, my dear students, we have technology, we have techniques, we have technicality all around us.
So when I talk about technical language, talk to somebody who does not know literature, who does not know the forms of literature, and you use a word like song, a word like ballad, maybe he wouldn't even know, or a word like lyric, lyric maybe he exactly. wouldn't even know what we are talking about. But my dear students of literature, you know that these are technical terms. That is, these terms might have another meaning in ordinary language, but they have a special, specific meaning for us. Again, if you look at the computer, there are so many words. What is a mouse in reference to a computer? <laughs> so also, we have to learn the technical language. Can I have this slide, please? And therefore, we are now going to learn some new terms. Or, if you've already learned it in the class, we are going to revise these terms for you. The first term that we are looking at is iambus. Notice, my dear students, at the end of that line, you notice that there is a short and a long. The symbol, a short and a long. Now, the meter would mean whatever is in between those two vertical lines. That is one meter. So we have an example of, for you of iambus, which is, we have for you, iambus, examples that we have. That is, uh, today, Re rebuke, ahead, allow, secure, and uh, Ma'am, I think we need to tell them that the very word iambus has a rising. Absolutely. Tone. You have first an unstressed and then a then stressed. Or if you look at it from the prosody point of view, you first have a short and then you have a long. Look at chalky. Look again, my dear. It's the opposite of the iambus. In the iambus, you have the unstressed or the short followed by the stressed or the long. Mm -hmm. Notice the symbols. Then it will become clear. Right. Now, what happens in Amita? What words do we have as examples of trochi for our students? Uh, never, mm -hmm. giant, mm -hmm. picture, heating. Oh, so, what do we have? Long followed by short. Then we move to spondy. Slide again, please. We have the spondy. Now, what happens in the spondy? Please notice, my dear students. It is again two syllables. But notice the symbols. And what do you see? What do you see? You see that both of them are, I'm sure I, all of you have got the answer right, both of them are long. That is, both of them are stressed, like you've got rocks, caves. The parik is a total opposite of that, where both of them are unstressed, or both of them are short. And therefore, you've got not so. Don't be confused, my dear students. If you keep looking at it, more than once, if you take out words, if you take out lines of poetry and read them aloud, I'm sure all that I'm telling you here will become very, very clear. When we hear it the first time, most people think it's impossible to learn prosody. Most of you might be scared of the term scansion. Just do it more than once. And as has been said again and again, practice makes perfect. That is absolutely true of the process of scansion, scansion, Namita. Can we have the slide again? We move on now, my dear students, to trisyllabic. The word tri, I'm sure you know, means three. So what do we have three here? Notice again, we've got short, short, long. Mm -hmm. Namita, right. right? You notice the yes. um, symbols that we have there? Definitely. Short, short, short long. long. Can we have some words, Namita? Uh, disagree. Mm -hmm. Employee, mm -hmm. Japanese, volunteer. Absolutely. And dactyl again is just the opposite of that. And mm -hmm. so, Namita, you can have words for dactyl. Energy, operate, organize. Wonderful. What happens in poetry? These words, these patterns recur again and again. And uh, ma'am, if I yeah. may interrupt, yeah, sure. I think uh, an easy way to remember is that first we should take the iambus mm -hmm. and then you know that the opposite of iambus is the trochee. Mm -hmm. Then you have the spondy. Mm -hmm. The opposite of spondy is the peric. Mm -hmm. Then you have the anapist and the opposite of anapist is the dactyl. So that would make 
make it quite mathematical if i may oh, say so wonderful i think you're making it sound like abc <laughs> huh it's as simple as that so my dear students all that you have to do is to remember them in pairs, pairs. you know anything you remember in pairs always we talk of binaries right. right binaries are so important so it becomes very very easy if you can remember it that way what have we done we have looked at words to understand the concept of iambus etc let's move on and read a little poetry which will make it clear if i look at iambus my dear students i've got thus i pass by and die as one unknown and gone i made a shade and laid in the grave there have my cave where tell i dwell farewell and the trocky would be never 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 this is shakespeare oh. you know mm -hmm. there the wrinkled old nokumis nursed the little hiawatha rocked him in his linden cradle bedded soft in moss and rushes safely bound with reindeer sinews stilled his fretful wail by saying hush the naked bear will hear thee mm -hmm. Let's move on to the spondy drop drop slow tears and bathe those beauteous feet which brought from heaven the news and prince of peace and perik not so when swift camilla scars the plain flies o'er the unbending corn and skims along the main the anapist from the show come the notes to their mill where it floats to okay. their house and their mill tethered fast to the small wooden isle where their work to beguile they from morning to evening even take whatever is given what do you need to do students look at each of these lines i'm sure you don't immediately know which poems they are taken from but that doesn't matter take any poem where uh, you feel that the right and the left margins are are clear you understand what i mean it's like justified in the in the computer language look at that when the lines end at the same place it's likely that the syllables can be counted mm -hmm. now count the syllables first break the words into syllables mm -hmm. that's very easy right once you've done that then you mark stress and stress stress and stress see whether it's following any pattern is it one unstressed followed by one stressed or one short followed by one long if it becomes simple then you start putting your vertical lines but we'll take that up in greater detail right. let's have an example of dactyl also namita right. perishing gloomily spurred, spurred by. by contumely cold in humanity burning insanity uh coleridge had a very beautiful poem mm -hmm. just to make this clear okay. and so he says trocky trips from long to short from long to long in solemn sort slow spondy stocks strong footil able ever to come up with dactyl trisyllable i am big march from short to long with a leap and bound the swift anapus throng look at these poets look at these poets how they are able to combine both sense and sound that's you know that's what makes great poetry and after all i'm talking of coleridge one of the greatest poets not only of the romantic age but of all times have we clearly understood stress and unstress long and short if we have then i would like to go on to talking about feet right uh i'm sure all of you at some time or the other have had to measure something you might use an inch tape you might use a uh, you might use a ruler a foot ruler mm -hmm. uh, very simply people don't have all this they just use their you know one hand length they say equal to a foot probably usually so we have got some fixed measure so in scansion also we use the word feet remember we are using the word feet because the idea of scansion the theory of scansion is quite old and it's based on greek poetry mm -hmm. uh we have also moved on to meter so you have got both those words my dear students if you are thinking of how the feet has moved on to the metrical system and today we use the word meter what do we mean by feet we have given you ever so many examples let us just take anapis let us just take iambus mm -hmm. because we said that iambus is the commonest mm -hmm. 
in the English language. Mm. So you've got two syllables. Right. Now, if the two syllables come once, mm. then it is a monometer. monometer. If the two syllables come twice, Just it becomes a diameter. diameter. If the two syllables come thrice, it becomes a trimeter. Tri Students, you can play this game with your friends when you are free, when the teacher is not there, when it's a rainy day and there are very few students in class. You could try and play this game. What is the game? Suppose there are 10 syllables. You ask them, what is it? You give them a hint. You say it is iambic mm -hmm. and there are 10 syllables and you'll get the answer from the bright students and from the students who are willing to take the challenge, it is the iambic pentameter. The iambic pentameter is one of the most important, mm -hmm. right? One of the most important meters because it is what we use in the couplet, right. the iambic pentameter. Uh, think of uh, Pope's Rape of the Lock, for example. You have the couplet and it is iambic pentameter. What does that mean? Every line has 10 syllables, syllables. right? And then you divide it further there are five feet, okay? There are five meters. And what are they? They are iambic. That means you've got two. And you've got two in a particular order, my dear. Remember, you cannot have one stressed and unstressed and then unstressed and stressed. Right. It has to follow that beat because we are talking about the rhythm of poetry. And the rhythm of poetry comes only when the same thing is repeated feet. again and again. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could tap your feet, right? Or you could do this to have the tal of music. So iambic pentameter, you could have iambic trimeter, right. you could have dactylic pentameter, hmm. right? You'll have to work on that. Hmm. But remember, my dear students, this is an artificial way. After all, what makes us say that 12 inches make one foot? Mm -hmm. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing God given about it. Right. There's nothing that you cannot change. This is a matter of convenience right. where we say 12 inches make, make one, one foot. Three. Right? Or 100 meters make. Right. You go on like that. So also, let us remember that feet, the measurement, the rhythm that we are talking about, the division of rhythm. Remember, rhythm is natural. Mm -hmm. But the division of rhythm is, is something artificial. which is artificial, which we have made it for our convenience. Can we have the next slide, please? Yeah. This is Milton who says, first taught our English music how to span. How to span, my dear students, is how to measure words with just a note and accent. This is Milton's uh, uh, compliment to the poet Henry Laws. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Namita, you and I don't know who Henry Laws is. We, do, we I, don't. I, I, I don't. Because we don't read him. Idea. Absolutely. Right. But Milton has given him such a great compliment. And so we remember him. You know, when we look at uh, prosody, when we look at scansion, isn't it interesting? Right. right? Uh, Henry Laws owes it to Milton that mm -hmm. we still remember his name. This is an art, my dear students. Scansion is an art. You have to make an effort to learn any art. I'm sure some of you have learned dance, some on music, some on poster making, right? right? Any any art, you need to have a certain amount of practice. practice. First, you should know what it is all about, mm -hmm. right? Even if you're singing light film songs, right? Mm -hmm. You need to have some idea of the beat, of the rhythm. So what do we do? First, you have to get the idea of the tune, mm -hmm. the beat, and the lilt. You know, by lilt, I mean the rising and the falling. That you have Absolutely. to get. And then, let's move on to steps. Sometimes, Amita, I think prosody makes poetry very prosaic, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. we are looking at it, one, two, three, four, and poetry is about flow. Right. But then we are talking about rhythmic flow. That's what we need to remember. Mm -hmm. Just talking about numbers might make it seem prosaic. But when you realize that you're doing it because you want to ensure, you know, that that flow is there, then you realize how poetic it is, how rhythmic it is. Right. So what do we do? We need to look at word stress. We need to count them and when we need to decide on. Can we have the next slide, please? Next slide, please. We are looking at a simple poem. We are looking at a simple poem in order to have some sort of practical steps. Mm -hmm. Can we have the slide, please? Look at the poem. The next one, please. This is a very, very famous poem by Matthew Arnold. Arnold. Let's read the poem, my dear students. The sea is calm tonight. The tide is full. 
The moon lies fair upon the straits. On the French coast, the light gleams and is gone. The cliffs of England stand glimmering and vast out in the tranquil bay. Come to the window, sweet is the night air. My dear students, you notice that those lines there indicate that we have to move on to the next line. To make it convenient, we have it continuously in the same line. But if you are writing it on a piece of paper, on a page, you will probably, the sea is calm tonight, mm -hmm. you will move on to the next line. The tide is full, the moon lies fair. Okay? But you get the idea of how this simple poem we can use in order to do scansion. So what are we looking at? We have to begin. We have the poem in front of you. Mm -hmm. Begin by counting the nouns. I've told you already that nouns have a long accent. We are talking of monosyllabic nouns. So could we count some of the nouns, my dear students? Let's do it quickly. And we have Namita doing it for you. The sea, nouns that we have. Tide, moon, straits, coast, light. Cliffs, England, bay, window, night, air. Notice that when you have single syllables, there's no problem. Mm -hmm. But when you have double syllables, more than one syllable, that is bisyllabic, disyllabic words, then you need to have one stressed and one unstressed. unstressed. Or if you use the language of prosody, one long and one short. Mm -hmm. What about adjectives, Namita? Students, come on. Let's very quickly look at the adjectives. Let's begin with calm. Full, fair, French, glimmering. Then we have vast, tranquil, sweet. Notice again, when we look at glimmering and tranquil, you would have to do something about them. Because look at the word tranquil, tranquil, tranquil. Say that again, my dear students, and you will realize that it is long followed by short. short. Tranquil. What about the verbs? They are all long. Yes. Uh, we have uh, to be as in am, is, are, Yeah, art. but they are all short. Right. We have to tell our students that those words, uh, those verbs are short. short. But what about the other verbs? Then we have... Come. Uh, hmm? um, yes, we have uh, to have. We come, have gleams. Yeah. Definitely. Mm. Lies. Mm. Stand. Mm. Uh, and as you mentioned, ma'am, come. Yeah, absolutely. Remember that prepositions and conjunctions are always short. Mm -hmm. Prepositions and conjunctions are always short. Mm -hmm. So are articles, right. right? Because they are only serving, as I mentioned earlier, a grammatical purpose. Uh, what have we done, my dear students? What have we done? We have taken a simple poem. We have tried to understand how we begin counting. How do we count? By keeping some of these simple rules in mind. Is it true that always all poems are in the same regular meter? Is it that any poem that you take up for the entire poem you can have iambic trimeter or dactylic pentameter? My dear students, the answer is no. You can do this kind of scansion for a line, maybe for a poem, uh, sorry, maybe for a verse, what we call a verse paragraph maybe. But if you try and apply it to Milton's Paradise Lost, for example, I'm sure you'll be totally lost. Don't try to do that with long poems, right? right. We want to understand the meter. We want to understand the regularity of meter. Then we must do it only with shorter passages from good poetry. For example, if you look at the blank verse of Shakespeare, certainly look at the good poems, uh, look at the good passages, and you'll see how easily it lends itself to this kind of scansion. Mm -hmm. But you can't take the entire play of Hamlet and expect, you know, this to happen. It doesn't happen. The same it cannot happen. Right. Because as critics have reminded us again and again, when you force yourself to write in a particular way, it becomes artificial. Mm -hmm. And great poets do not believe in artificiality. Mm -hmm. Right? Whatever they are saying has to come natural. And that is why sometimes we talk about the inbuilt rhythm of a poem. Mm -hmm. You know, the inbuilt rhythm. It might not really stand to this kind of testing. Right. 
right. that it's 10 syllables or 12 syllables or 15 syllables or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there is something in, you know, in some of Eliot's poems, for example, right. some of 20th century poetry, you would find this. You know, this happens very often. I want you to look at what we call mixed meter. Mm -hmm. You know, mixed meter is where in one line you probably have a very clear, you know, anapist. Right. Iambic. Let's take iambic as the example yeah. because that's the most common one and it's the easiest to understand. But sometimes what happens is there is a change. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the, along the way, as you are reading the poem, you will realize that there is a shift. You will notice that it changes and then we call it occasional meter. I'm talking about mixed meter. My dear students, we go with the assumption that you've already understood the regular meters. Having understood the regular meters, we are going into what are called mixed meters. That is, you make a combination. You know, there could be a dactylic pentameter right. followed by an iambic pentameter. pentameter. Right? So, this could happen. So, then we call it occasional. Right. Take an entire poem. You will find that it works in the first line of every verse. Mm -hmm. But the second line is different. different. Okay? So, then we call it occasional. You could also call it irregular. The irregular could be within the line, mm -hmm. even within the line, or it could be within the, I'm used the word paragraph because I want to uh, just get it across to my students that we say verse paragraph mm -hmm. for words which we generally use as stanza, right. right, as verse. Why does the writer do it? Why does the poet do it? It could be, it could be for euphony. You know the word euphony, my dear students? That is the music. The opposite of euphony, someone, some of you might know, is cacophony. You know, when there's a lot of noise, bass or avas, then we call it cacophony. Mm -hmm. But what we are looking for in poetry naturally is euphony. euphony. And you find that. In mixed meter, you could have what is called catalexis. My dear students, these are very, very specific, specialized terms. But you need to understand. When you read a poem and you suddenly find that there is an I and there is no N, you know, or there is an I and there's no T and there's just an apostrophe on the top. Why does the poet do it? Let me tell the poet does it because he doesn't want to break the rhythm of the, mm -hmm. and as you just mentioned, you and me, you and me, you know, you and me right. is not you and me. Mm -hmm. So in the same way, sometimes because he doesn't want the rhythm to be beaten, uh, to be broken, he could just just get rid of, you know, this would be like would not, would not, would be replaced by wouldn't, 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 wouldn't. See, wouldn't, my dear students, becomes one syllable, whereas would not, can not, right? Can. And therefore, very often, the poet just gets rid of one syllable, just drops a syllable, omits a As syllable. As for example, the line that we read out. Instead of writing in the grave, he's mm. written in the grave. In the grave, in the grave, in, in the, the grave. grave. Right? And when you read it that way, you right. know, the flow, the rhythm. Is maintained. Is maintained. Hypometry, interestingly, I'm not very happy saying this, Namita, mm -hmm. is also called a feminine ending. Oh. And one critic okay. points out, why do we call it feminine ending? Because it does not end at the end of the line, but continues on to the next line. Oh. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they say, because... Feminine females don't stop talking. They oh. go on and on. I don't like the, the reason why it's called feminine ending. But that's the explanation that a critic has given. It goes on to the next line. Hypometry, you would notice, is when the, it does not stop at the end of the line, but it goes on into the next line. Mm -hmm. We could take an example. It's a beautiful example from Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. uh, Namita, I'm sure you can read it out to our students. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. Notice, you know, it doesn't. If you, if you start marking iambic pentameter, you'll notice how it goes on, on to the next line. Another uh, mixed meter that we have to understand is elision. It is the omission or the slurring over of a syllable. For example, let us take a simple word like F-L-O-W-E-R. Sometimes you pronounce it as flower, hmm. right? Flower. Hmm. But sometimes when you want to retain the rhythm, so what do you say? Flower. Flower. Right? So what are you doing? You are just sort of 
gliding over you know very beautifully it's like uh, gliding it's like paragliding mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. where you just uh, okay. slur over you know you just go over that is elision we are looking at pairs namita pointed out to you that you must take them together so that you understand in the same way diresis is the opposite of is the absolute opposite of elision if in elision you are slurring over what you do in diresis is just the opposite instead of one syllable you have two syllables for example why should we in the compass of a pale keep law and form and due proportion okay so you have the stress being maintained more you know so that each syllable so that you do not break the uh, break the syllable count when you read the poem uh, the entire line mm-hmm. to uh, whom the winged hierarch reply, replied o adam one almighty is from whom all things proceed and up to him return if not depraved from good created all such to perfection one must one first matter all you know look at a word like created mm-hmm. when you want and you want to make it elision you'll say created created right, right. and then when you want to have it diresis because you want to maintain the rhythm mm-hmm. then you will say created. created created right this is what the poet does very beautifully in order to ensure that the rhythm of the poem is maintained, maintained. another occasional mixed meter is when you have a cesura a cesura it comes from the latin word which means pause can we have a line namita is an example i think the most famous of them all a thing of beauty is a joy forever keats is endymion my dear students where do you pause you know this is the question this is what cesura means where do you pause for poetic effect a thing of beauty is a joy forever you can't read it like that you have to pause there's another beautiful line namita i'm sure you you can find it for us from macbeth oh yes lady think, macbeth yeah is this a dagger that i see before me where do you want to pause is this the dagger that i see before me no that's no poetry mm-hmm. shakespeare would not have it like that mm-hmm. and i'm sure the elizabethan stage would not have it like that Definitely. so what do you do you pause at the end of uh, after dagger Hmm. So Namita how would the students have to read it for us Is this a dagger that I see before me Notice notice how the lilt comes right you pause after dagger and this is what we call cesura Cesura Again let's look at the opposite of cesura and we've got enjambment where there is no pause and you quickly run over it A thing of beauty is a joy forever its loveliness increases it will never pass into nothingness but still will keep a bar quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing wonderful my dear students can we have the slide again please can we quickly quickly you could jot down or you could try and remember or retain it remember all the different kinds of mixed meter that we have we've got occasional irregular for the sake of effect catalexis hypometry elision diresis schizura enjambment and now all these are what adds to the mixed meter let us move on to rhyme i've talked about rhythm but when we are looking at poetry when we are looked looking at good poetry rhyme also contributes to the musical effect Generally my dear students when we look at rhyme when we hear the word rhyme we imagine that rhyme comes at the ends of lines at the ending so if i end a line with uh, sleep the second line should end with deep or reap or heap or weep that's what we imagine but when we look at rhyme there are different kinds of rhyme and i want you to be able to understand and appreciate this for example we can have internal rhyme namita can we have a line or two please this is from the ancient marina mm-hmm. and now there came both mist and snow and it grew wondrous cold and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald notice my dear students that the rhyme is within the line mm-hmm. it is within the line okay so if you've got now 
you've got snow in those days snow was pronounced snow okay. if you've got ice, ice then you've got right immediately i'm sorry if you've got high you've got bye okay so where is the rhyme not at the end mm -hmm. the the rhyming is within the line right. this is what we call internal rhyme in, we could have yeah could the, we have the, another line please the next lines in yeah. fact are and through the drifts the snowy cliffs so here drifts and absolutely cliffs. absolutely did send a small dismal sheen nor shapes of men nor beasts we ken the ice was all between so you've got men ken between you know how the between. rhyming is not at the end of the line but within the line right. so this is also a kind of rhyme mm -hmm. and this we call internal rhyme the next kind of rhyme that i want you to look at is feminine rhyme in the feminine rhyme could just read one or two the sun has long been set the stars are out by twos and threes the little birds are piping yet among the bushes and trees english is a very interesting language namita words don't sound the way they look mm -hmm. you know uh, if if you take uh, t h o u g h and t h r o u g h right right they sound they look and then take r o r o u g h mm -hmm. so you've got r o u g h Rough. Uh, yeah you've got rough and then you've got true true so you've got i mean it's so funny it's so different and that is why we have to learn the pronunciation right. separately you can't just look at the letters and decide that this is going to this is going to be the way in which it is pronounced right so such words we call the i rhyme mm -hmm. to the i it seems like a rhyme but it is not really a rhyme mm -hmm. could we have just one quick example they key So what about day and key? You look at e y, and then it looks like a rhyme, but it's not actually a rhyme. Rhyme. My dear students, what have Namita and I tried to do for you, to have you go through very very quickly? You know, prosody and scansion, Namita, are so interesting that I think we could go on for another couple of hours and talk about it. One, because English poetry is so vast. The the experiments that have been done, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, with kinds of meters. is so vast mm -hmm. that you could talk on and on but i'm sure my dear students you will agree that this has given you a sort of an insight into what prosody is all about given you an idea about the steps that you have to take if you are interested in the process of scansion what are the terms the technical words that you should do what are the rules that you should follow when you are trying when you are trying to understand the stress patterns in the english language how you have to look at meter what are the different kinds of meter that are possible we have tried to do all this i think namita mm -hmm. at quite a breakneck speed we in the course of this one hour um yeah namita what would you what would you like to tell our students ma'am you're absolutely right and i think uh, prosody today would be clear clearer not just for our students but the teachers as well mm -hmm. it was a very good revision for me definitely and uh, i think before we are accused of hypermetry two women going on and on I and feminine ending i guess <laughs> <laughs> so i think we better take leave uh, thank you so much for coming down ma'am and it was uh, i i think we enjoyed the lecture i think poetry doing the lecture doing yes doing the lecture de definitely and uh, i think poetry is something that is always enjoyable and uh, i think uh, from today the students would look at it more deeply we just uh, don't read the poem of course read it for enjoyment it is meant to be enjoyed but as students try and analyze poetry as well thank you so much and thank you ma'am for thank joining thank you namita us. for a wonderful lecture together thank you